Nimer also has, um, as, as you know, we've had garage fires year to year that are often caused uh, by, by electrical issues and trucks and the like. We have fire prevention bulletin and uh, a checklist for your garage that we can email to you. We have a number of courses that relate to DPW issues, many online uh, safety uh, driving related courses, loader operation, uh, you know, dump truck operation, safe backing and parking, so, uh, and driving in inclement weather. So there's uh, a lot of resources that are available to you. And that will be your documentation that this training was attended by those individuals. So those folks, uh, we don't have any way to verify and they, they will not get a certificate, but you can always staple that sign-in sheet to the certificate that you receive. So uh, all that said, we're gonna get moving. I'm gonna introduce our presenter. Bruce Johnson, uh, many of you are familiar with him. He's done our snow and ice around the state uh, for the last couple of years. He's retired after uh, 30 years or so of service with the state DOT. He started uh, just as an entry level laborer like a lot of you guys and uh, equipment operator instructor, general foreman, uh, regional training manager and motor equipment manager responsible for um, the territory along the Canadian border all the way from Watertown to Plattsburgh. So you can imagine that, uh, you know, he's seen a lot, of, a lot of heavy snow and he's in a great position to give you some really great uh, advice and, and training today. So uh, he's spent his entire life, uh, his entire adult life in the world of trucks and heavy equipment operation and maintenance his uh, very extensive experience and knowledge of this equipment is going to be uh, shared with all of you today. So uh, with that, Bruce, I'm going to turn it on over to you, okay? Very good. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dave, for the, for the intro. And good morning, everybody. Um, I'd like to, to just start out this morning with saying I'm very sorry that I can't be with you in person. I really enjoy coming out and visiting with everybody and, and doing these programs. It's nice to get back to, to dealing with the people that really get the job done. And, and I have a very soft spot, in, soft spot in my heart for all of the municipal workers because that's what I did for over 30 years. And like Dave said, I started as a laborer on a plow crew in Oswego County. I live in Oswego County, uh, which is right off the tip of Lake Ontario, right in the, the lake effect zones. And uh, was very fortunate in my career uh, to be in the right places at the right time and work hard and, and be able to have the career that I did. So I spent over 17 years of my career in the training department for the DOT and was able to travel across the entire state uh, doing different trainings and, and gaining experience to, uh, that's going to turn around and, and be able to be used to share with you folks. So with that, uh, I'm not here to tell you really how to do your job. The, the intent of this program today is to be a reminder that we need to be safe out there. And it's just something to kind of get your, your mind headed in that direction, you know, for the season that's, that's upon us. So I have a, a lot of respect for the experiences that you all have. And we all work and live in different uh, areas that have different requirements and some of you are going to be involved with things that I don't have a lot of experience with. However, my experience in the snow and ice realm ranged from very rural areas, uh, all, you know, like we talk about up through the Adirondacks and, and whatnot, all the way to the metropolitan areas. I was a general foreman in, in the west part of Syracuse with really high traffic volumes and high snowfall rates and whatnot. So, a lot of different experience to draw from. So with that, we'll get going. Hey, Bruce, um, I, I, have you got your screen on full screen or is it on? Uh... I do. Okay, that's fine. Just making sure. Thank you. Yep. So we'll get going. So if you, if you folks have to take a phone call or do something, by all means, at least in this realm, um, just do what you got to do. Hopefully I can keep your attention enough for, the, for about the next hour. Um, that you will you know, abandon those calls and, and stick with us here. 
So the season's upon us. Tuesday morning, when I was headed up to my daughter's house, this is the picture on the road up to her house, uh, just outside of Barnes Corners in the, in the foothills of, of Tug Hill. And the season's here. I mean, this was just a couple of days ago. So I took a couple of snapshots here. Um, I've been working on her house, building her a new house this summer, and we're on the final stages. But uh, I've been traveling this route since uh, June, basically, and, and winter's upon us. So the next thing you know, we're going to be looking at, at, at a little different view uh, right out the windshield of your truck. And we, we've got to get our head wrapped around that and start thinking about that. Now, of course, the weather turned around now. It's going to be sunny. It's going to be 60s and 70s for the next week or two. But we all know we've been around long enough that it's not going to be long and it's going to look more like this. And then on some days, it'll be even a little fuzzier. It'll look a little bit like this. Believe it or not, Monday night, uh, that's about what it looked like. It was very difficult to see up here in some of the snow coming off the end of the lake. And uh, luckily, it didn't last very long and the weather's warm. Okay. So just a couple of shots to get you in the mood. So what we're, what we're going to do today, we're going to go over a bunch of different things, but we're going to talk about why we do what we do. Okay. We're going to talk about equipment pre and post trip inspections, equipment maintenance, preseason scouting and route review, operator training, and some basic operational procedures. Remember, when we talk about this, there's only so many ways to dice up this information. And for those of you that were with me last year, this is essentially the same program that I've freshened up a little bit and condensed a whole bunch because what we were doing in two and a half hours, I'm now gonna do in an hour. So why do we do what we do? Well, you know, there's, there's many different reasons out there, but the, the, really the biggest thing that's out there is safety of the public. We have to make sure that, that, that people can get around safely and be able to continue to do most of their normal activities. With that, life safety, fire, ambulance, et cetera. So what we're talking about there is a lot of times we can get around and, and we might even get the main roads open. But I look back into 2003 and 2007 were two big storms I was involved with in, uh, in this neck of the woods where we had big lake effect events. And with those events, the, uh, the amount of snow was pretty intense. The main roads were open, but then the city streets got plugged up. Well, now you can't get a fire truck or an ambulance or anything down these streets. And, and now we've got a real problem. So at that point in my career, I was working in the command center for the DOT and we sent in extra snowblower crews and removal crews to open up these city streets. And it really made a big difference. We have to have the ability to get around safely. So with that, you know, we're talking about just day-to-day -day operations, being able to just move about in a safe manner. And we have to be able to move goods and materials for the economy. The sake of the economy is huge in the, in the respect that everything is done anymore on just-in-time services. That means that that assembly line that's working is working just in time. They don't have extra materials on hand. They don't have big warehouses full of stuff to carry them for a week or two weeks. They're waiting for that truck to back into the dock and unload so they can keep that line moving. And it's important that we can keep those goods and materials moving to be able to support that. And then just plain quality of life. So we just need that particular quality of life that we can get out and do what we're going to do and be able to go to the movies and be able to do things and, you know, just continue on with life. So here's an example. That fire truck's not doing anybody any good stuck in the snow on a city street. 
it's a, it's a bad program. You know, lives are at stake. If somebody's having a heart attack or there's a house fire or whatever, we got to be able to get around. Same with the ambulance. We've got to be able to move that ambulance and we've got to be able to get around and, uh, and get to where we got to get to. And then people have to be able to do what they're doing. And we have to be able to continue our normal lives the best we can. Now, it's one thing in certain parts of the state where you get a snowstorm and it lasts for a few hours or whatever, and it's over with. In other parts of the state, you have to get multiple day after day after day of the snow. We have to be able to continue some normality to our lives. And the goods and services have to be able to get around. We have to be able to keep that commerce moving. So I, I dwelled on that enough. We'll move over into pre and post trip inspections. And, you know, I guess we've kind of determined, you know, why we're out there doing what we're doing. And now how are we going to go about that and, and be safe and have safe equipment out there? So pre and post trips inspections, they're regulated by the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration. And there's not, they're regulated in the sense that we need to do them. They're not regulated in exactly how you do them. So there's some flexibility there for you as a municipality to tailor this to your own needs. They're required daily. So we need to do a pre and post trip every day. If you're running multiple shifts, they need to be done every shift. They need to be kept on file for three months. And they need to be signed by the operator. This is a tool that you can use, that you should use to keep your thoughts in line. Now, the older I get, the harder that is for me to keep my thoughts in line. So, if you've got a check sheet in front of you, simple check sheet meant to take 10, 15 minutes to do a pre-op or a post-op, not a long time. If you've got those sheets for you there, you can keep track of what you're doing. I know as soon as I'm in the middle of something and somebody asks me a question or the phone rings or whatever, and I go back and try to pick up where I left off, it's a lot harder now than it used to be. And I'm apt to miss things. The other thing is having these sheets allows you to keep a record that can go between operators. Now I realize in some municipalities, you're the only guy that ever drives the truck. A little easier for you to keep track. But I know in other situations, you've got two or more shifts and you may be in a different truck from day to day. Well, in that case, it's really nice to be able to have some continuity on what's going on with that truck. What went wrong with it during the shift? What got fixed? What needs to be fixed, et cetera. So it's a good way to keep track of that stuff. Here's an example of a, of a simple check sheet. Doesn't have to be high tech. Um, in some regard, in some places, you're gonna do uh, one sheet that'll carry you on for a week or maybe two weeks. State DOT used one that was good for a pay period, what's good for two weeks, the way they tailored it. In other situations, they're gonna use a sheet that's filled out every day um, individually, like this one here. This is meant to be an ind individual day or shift sheet. Big thing is we need to get in the habit. It's got to be part of your day. It's got to be a routine. We're going to talk a little bit about things today in regards to setting the culture. You, you need to establish a culture in your facility that this is part of the day, it's expected, and support that and work with each other to make it happen. Develop that routine, do it the same way every time. That's also important. And the way that I taught my, my pupils when I was doing this was, you first thing you do is you get in the truck or the piece of equipment and you take the key out and you look at the previous day's report. See what gives you a heads up. Make sure the vehicle's secure. 
then you get out of the vehicle and you go in the same direction every time. Doesn't matter how you do it. It's a matter of doing it the same way every time and just being in a routine. The other part that happens with pre and post trips, and I've been there over the years, you work a lot of hours, you work a lot of odd hours. And before you know it, you're a robot. You're just trying to survive. You're tired and you're just fatigued. And I can remember standing in the shop in the middle of the night, coming in on shift at midnight. And I go out and I stand to the truck and I, and I know I'm supposed to be pre op in it, but I'm just kind of glazed over. What am I looking at? And, and you got to kind of pull yourself together and that check sheet can help you do that. But you have to remember nine times out of 10, if you break down on the road with one of these trucks, it's probably something little that, that started the whole thing. If you can catch that little thing in the shop, boy, it's a lot easier to, to continue on and have a good day. Use the buddy system to check the lights or, or do whatever. Um, I like using the buddy system for greasing trucks too. I mean, I'm a little ahead of myself on that, but work together. That's the big thing. We're all in this together, work together. Remember the little things can cause big issues. That little cotter pin that's missing or a hairpin clip or a nut that's rattled loose can really screw things up. And we don't have time to have breakdowns. And that is so true. We're going to talk a little bit just briefly about cycle times and whatnot. So if you've got X number of, of a number of trucks in a shop, they all have their own route. If somebody breaks down. Now you've got to divvy that route up amongst the other trucks. So that extends your cycle times. Well, that extension of the cycle times also reduces the level of service and that affects our goal that we were started out looking for right from the begin with, and that's safety to the public. Seat belts are a pet peeve of mine. They're installed in all the trucks and they need to be worn as designed. And I like the fact that on a lot of new trucks now, people are putting in orange seat belts so that supervision can see them, your peers can see them, see whether you've got them on correctly or not. You need to wear them. In part of my career, part of my life, I guess, I spent five years working in as a, an advanced EMT on a local ambulance corps uh, as a volunteer. And one of the worst scenarios that I ever saw was a two person fatality in a 30 mile per hour speed zone where a vehicle ran a stop sign at a T intersection and it was a smaller car and it was T-boned by a full size Suburban. The guy in the back seat of the Suburban died. He was not strapped in. The vehicle spun, rolled up on its side and he was ejected partway out and crushed. An infant in the small vehicle died because it was not locked in the car seat and the force of the impact threw the, the child out of the car window and against a curbing. One of the worst accidents I ever witnessed, and it was right in a 30 mile per hour speed zone. And both of those people would have walked away had they had their seat belts on or been locked in the car seat. There's the example of the orange belt that I was talking about, it's high vis. Um, there's there's nothing to be ashamed of for calling somebody out for not wearing a seat belt. They work. And I, I've seen countless cases of it. They work. Remember, the little things can cause big issues. You know, you rattle that cotter pin out of the telescoping rod on your plow and then, and then the plow flops over and digs in and you drive over the plow. That's a bad day. That's a big bill for the insurance company right there. And stop and think about who pays that bill. When we really think about what we're doing and we think about the money that, that goes on and how we spend it, I always try to bring back to everybody, you have to remember who's paying the bill. And each and every one of us on this webinar are paying the bill. We're dealing with taxpayer money and we need to use it like it's our own. And I'm a firm believer in that. And when I was working in my last eight years of my career with DOT, you know, I had a multi-million dollar budget, but
but I treated every penny of it like it was my own and tried to do very well by the taxpayers with that. Keep that in mind that 50 cent cotter pin or hairpin clip might save you a bill for this truck here. Wouldn't surprise me if that's 50 or $60,000 in damage by the time they get looking that truck over and the undercarriage of the truck and the plow and whatnot. Remember your mirrors. You gotta be able to have situational awareness around you. I'm gonna hit on that a couple of times through the program. You gotta know what's going on. So when you're sitting in that truck as part of your pre-trip, make sure your mirrors are adjusted. Tires, wheels, and rims. One of the largest expenses in a fleet outside of fuel and, the, and now the cost of the operator has risen up there um, to be comparable, but it's tires, wheels, and rims. And this is the same picture I used last year in the program. Here's an example of this rim is cracked right up and around these bolt holes. You catch that on a pre-trip, get that thing off there and save yourself a breakdown or a potential very, very expensive accident or or even worse, getting somebody hurt, um, that wheel drop or comes off, comes apart and the wheel itself weighs 300 pounds. That goes rolling down the road, hits another vehicle, kills somebody. That's a really bad day for something that we could have caught on a pre-op. Stuff lodged in between the tires. We all know what happens when that comes out. And, uh, you know, again, potential there for somebody to really get hurt. Here's a sign that Dave shared with me out of one of the shops that he visits. And uh, this is a good one. And this is right on the overhead door. Don't forget your pre-trip. Make sure your truck's clean. You know, when you share a truck with somebody else, it's, it's difficult sometimes. Some people are much better at housekeeping in that truck than others. And the way I looked at it and the way I always tried to, to instruct my folks that I was working with you spend more time in that truck than you do in your living room. Why don't you keep it clean? You know, don't throw your garbage under the seats and whatnot. Just clean it out. Make sure it's, an, it's a good place to work. And then we talk about over on this right sign about the master switch. And we're going to talk about electrical fires and whatnot a little further on. But it's a good reminder if you have master switches to make sure that they're shut off. We're gonna roll into some maintenance on the equipment. And so the last eight years of my DOT career, I was in charge of all of the maintenance and the, and the mechanics for an entire region. But that doesn't mean that I would expect that all of you folks are mechanics. I realize in your shops, if you're in a really small municipality, you, you may be the mechanic that handles most of the routine maintenance. If you're in a bigger shop, you may have dedicated mechanics and that's all they do. And in either scenario, that's all well and fine, but there's some basic things that an operator can do anyway and should be doing. And we're gonna talk about a few of those things. Washing and greasing the equipment is one of the biggest maintenance things that can be done. And an operator certainly should be doing that. You go into some shops and that's what your grease gun looks like. Well, that's not a good thing. So one of the other things that I do outside, outside of working, um, you know, my normal stuff, which you guys would say, well, you're retired now. Well, I may be retired, but I still keep pretty busy. But for many years now, my wife and I have run a beef farm in addition to our normal job. Let me tell you, my grease guns are used and they're used a lot. Now with the advent of the electric portable grease guns, it's, it's so much handier to work. And one of the things that I did and I taught when we were teaching to the operators was use the buddy system. And you take a hand pump grease gun like this and you're trying to lay on a creeper and you're under a truck trying to find the fitting and then you got to pump the gun so what we did is we made long hoses for the gun. And one guy would walk around the outside, the guy under the truck could 
get in there like a gentleman, clean the fitting, take the end of the hose from the second person, put it on the fitting, have the guy standing outside pump the gun for you, and then he'd move along with you. You worked as a team, and it really went along a lot better. I realize not every place has a mechanic. I get that, and that's, that's fine. Do you have a PM check sheet? So if you're working as the mechanic in the shop, this is a good tool for you. If you're not, does the mechanic have a PM check sheet? I know that there's a lot of highway superintendents on this call. Once again, it's a reminder. It's, it's a simple check sheet. It can look very much like your pre and post trip. You just modify it a little bit to, you know, maybe relate to all your grease fittings and your fluid level checks and your tire pressures. And you can record all of that and keep it on record have something to go by. So at one point in my career as a second job, I was maintaining a fleet of trucks for a recycling company. So my wife was working for the recycling company and I bring, she'd bring the trucks home for me to do at night. So one morning she's on her way to work and they started early. So it's like 5 30 in the morning, my phone rings and she goes, something wrong with this truck. She says the brakes are dragging really hard on it. And I thought about it. Well, that truck had manual slack adjusters. The phone had rang right in the middle of me doing that brake adjustment and I had tightened them up and never backed them off. Luckily, my wife is very competent. I told her how to do it and she got in and backed the, the, the brake off to where it needed to be until I could check it later in the day and everything was okay. The point that I'm trying to make is, is we forget things. The check sheet helps you remind all the things you're supposed to be taking care of on that piece of equipment. In regards to those recycling trucks, I had a different sheet for every truck. Most of it, the sheets were very similar, but I had tweaked the sheets for each truck and made a three ring binder for each truck. That way I pull the binder out when the truck came in, I'd have notes in there from the previous time it was in, something I needed to check up on, and then I could make my notes for the next time in there as well. It's just a way to keep everything straight. Do you keep any records? Like I said, my records were that three ring binder. I could look back through and see what I had. You guys need to at least keep folders for the bills and their, your maintenance cost and your, your records on your trucks and equipment anyway. It's a good way to keep that all together. When the post storm cleanup's been completed, take the time to wash and grease. Look it over. You know, when you got downtime or dark time, look it over and washing and greasing is absolutely huge. You need to, to take the time to do that. Corrosion is our biggest enemy in this world that we live in. And we have to make sure that we do everything we can to combat that. Not everybody has a facility like this. I get it. Some places you got a garden hose that runs off from a well and you're gonna say, well, I can pee a bigger stream that comes out that hose. I get that. There are some ways to, to get around that. You can use some booster pumps. Uh, you can use holding tanks to, to create a, a reserve of water sometimes, but there's usually ways to, to, to help with that situation. And then once again, getting under there and greasing everything and, and looking it over. If you have uh, a fitting that won't take grease, don't ignore it. Let's get that fixed. Let's figure out what's going on and, and repair that. When I worked as an instructor, I had a whole kit with me. Of course, I carried all kinds of tools and whatnot. But if we stumbled onto a fitting that wouldn't take grease, I had extra fittings with me. I had tools and whatnot. We could, we could usually take care of the issue. Remember the buddy system. Now this guy's using a pistol grip grease gun. That's okay. Nowadays you have the electric ones, that's better. And the buddy system I think only enhances either of those situations. Corrosion we talked about. I tried to find a different picture than what I used last fall, but this one really shows it very well. Uh, wiring and salt don't mix and, and here's what you get. So get in there and find these spots and get them clean and get some protective coatings on them and, and keep things in good shape. 
any of us that have been around a while remember back, you know, we used to complain about the trucks back in the 90s, 80s or 90s, whatever. But you know what? The old Cummins engine, you could turn the button out on the pump, give the truck a pull, roll it a little bit, get it started, and you could keep going. Well, with this equipment nowadays, with the electronics in them, that truck shuts down, and unless you got a laptop, you can't even do anything with it. So now it's a real problem. And a lot of those issues that we have with those trucks are corrosion related and in, in amongst the wiring. Cut in edges are another big thing that we have to work on. And I want to warn you, you know, those of you again that have been around, just to remind you, I guess, how sharp they can be on the used edges coming off. They're like razors on the bottom. So make sure you're wearing your, your gloves and your you know, the proper PPE. This was a method that we came up with many years ago using these lineup pins. Um, so you, you take one, in this case, this truck has carbides on it. So you take uh, one bolt out of each end of each of the carbides, put the six pins in there, and then you can take the rest of the bolts out. The overlay can lay right on those pins, take the carbides off, put the new ones on, clean your mold board, all that stuff. And then you can flip your overlay and put it back together. And it, the, the bars help you line everything up, but they also um, protect you from having that stuff fall down on you. You know, the guy that gets up behind there, and I watched it happen, he'd get up behind there and he'd cut the bolts off with a torch. And, and then he'd uh, take a sledgehammer and hit that iron and everything go crashing down on the floor. We don't need to work like that. The other thing is, Remember, anytime anything's in the air is the jack stands. So here's a pair of tall jack stands kind of hidden in behind here, but they're supporting that wing. On a front plow, you can use uh, regular short jack stands to support that, but never, never, never get under anything that's unsupported. Tire pressures are another big deal. When you're out there doing your your uh, pre and post trip, you're gonna check your tires, but let's face it, how many people put a gauge on them every day? And that's just not realistic. But when that storm's over with, or every week or every two weeks, whatever your system allows, check the tire pressures with a gauge. Underinflated tires are a huge issue. And you run a tire underinflated and that's what you get. They come apart. Our trucks are overloaded from the get-go. As soon as we hang the iron on them, that front axle is overloaded. As soon as we hang the iron on it. You can run whatever you want to run for axles and springs and all of that stuff, but buying a tire that is rated to carry the weight on that steer axle is very, very difficult. So the reality of it is, is our best defense is keeping the tires inflated correctly. Remember that when you're loaded with, with your iron on, and I say loaded, when you're carrying that iron and you're deadheading, just remember that you've got a tremendous amount of weight hung on that axle, and that's putting a tremendous amount of, of side flex in those tires, you know, sidewall flex, and that can contribute to this program right here. So when you get, if you ever get into the permit world and they talk about actual weight ratings and all of this, you can get permitted, but part of the permit when you read the fine print is, is it reduces your speed. And that's how they get away with it. They keep reducing speed based on the amount that you're overloaded. And in many regards, your speed may be reduced with a plow truck down to 40 or 45 miles an hour. Don't forget your battery boxes and the wiring. There's a lot of stuff in battery boxes and there's nothing to be afraid of, and there's nothing that a garden hose or, or even a pressure washer is going to hurt. There's a lot of connections in there, and on a lot of trucks, and I know the Macs were notorious for this, um, especially when they first came out, they were like a funnel, and the salt would just funnel right in and fill those battery boxes. So over the years, I know with the state, we did a lot of work with rubber flaps and this and that, trying to protect things and get the salt to not go in the areas where we didn't want it. But pop that cover off, make sure it's clean in there and everything is in good shape. Your hydraulic hoses, once again, um, a lot of hydraulic failures 
over the years have come from the fittings literally rotting apart. It isn't, you know, yeah, we'll lose a hose here and there in the middle of the hose, but we also lose them because the fittings rot off on the ends. So try to keep them clean and don't hesitate to coat them with, with any sort of oily product, you know, fluid film or um, any number of other different products that are out there. There's, a, there's LPS products, there's lots of them on the market. It, it helps, believe it or not, down the road, it helps. Anything we can do helps. Hopper chains, uh, you know, obviously run them, look them over, inspect them, and make sure that they're lubricated when you can. The off season is very hard on hopper chains. If you leave salt in there and whatnot, you need to run those. Uh, it'd be, it's nice if you could run them once a month or so and oil them, keep them freed up. I know that once again, if you've been around a while, you've seen hopper chains that you go to run the hopper in the fall and they're set up hard. And when you cut them out of there, you could use them as a ladder. They're, they're just froze right solid in all the links. So they need some attention as well. Here's just an example, um, you know, about hydraulic fittings. You can take that whole hydraulic bank right there and, and shoot a coating of some sort of protective film on it, and it'll help. Wind cables and shivs, um, you know, obviously here's a cable that has, has jumped the shiv, and this cable is not going to be any good. Um, you can see that it's broken right here. I'm just going to remind you too, when when we get tired and we get fatigued, be extra careful. I had a situation one time. I was shipped down to Long Island to work. We were working a lot of hours. I was really tired, and I had a wing slide hang up on me. Well, when it did, it jumped the shiv out on the front post. So I get out of the truck. It's in the middle of the night, and I go to put that cable back on and about the time I'm reaching for it, I'm thinking, what happens if that slide drops, that cable suddenly tightens up and I pulled my hand back. Well, luckily my hand came back, but my glove was stuck in there because it did, it dropped right about the time I was thinking about it. And so I ended up driving the truck back to the shop, which created a little bit of downtime, got some help, got that wing jacked up supported we got the cable back out repositioned and whatnot but i came really close to losing some of my fingers because i wasn't thinking straight i was tired and and basically had my head in my butt be careful with that now pay attention to your your cables also the best thing to do with a cable to check it and these cables need to be lubricated. They're, t they're actually called a wire rope. There's a, a center in there. And some of the centers are actually a nylon rope. And some of them are a, a, a wire rope that's in there. And then it's wrapped with these, with these individual cables laying on top of it, spiraled on there. You need to lubricate that. You need to use some sort of penetrating lubricant that will soak in and get into that inner core. So when you're checking your cables, especially your rear cables, the best thing to do is have somebody release the lever and pull out some slack. Nine times out of 10, that cable will break where it goes around the top shiv. Take a look at that and make sure there's no frays in it. If you see frayed wires in that cable, change it. If it's frayed on the outside, the inside of it's in worse shape. So don't ever hesitate. You know, we talk about places to save money. That's not one place you want to take a chance. We're going to talk a little bit about that more, uh, just a little further on in the program. We're going to talk a little bit about fire safety right now. So this is some pictures that, that was shared with me that uh, are from the Fort Edward, the town of Fort Edward garage. And looking at this, man, it doesn't look horrible. Yeah. You know, we got a little smoke damage on the outside. Looks like their back hole and their loader are in good shape. Yeah, not so bad. Well, not so good. That's their brand new tractor they'd gotten recently. Mowing tractor. Now that's a big purchase for a township. Have that. And the inside of the building doesn't look so hot at this point. Another view of the tractor. Really nice tractor. 
a lot of money sitting there and it's basically junk at this point. Here's the culprit of the fire. This small plow truck had an electrical issue and this is where they believe the fire started. Now, think about this. This is not a huge municipality. So now they got to beg, borrow and steal from other municipalities to keep going. This fire happened in May of 2019. They are now this fall just getting back into their rebuilt shop. The fire damage in there, the heat in there, deemed that building unsafe and the building had to be replaced. So think about a few things. Think about the fact that, thank God, nobody got hurt. Thank God they had insurance, that's, that's good. But somebody's paying that bill. Plus the fact that you're displaced for over a year, you're almost a year and a half, you're displaced and working at, you know, God knows what you're working out of at that point. Have you got a job trailer and an outhouse? Probably if you're lucky and you're using somebody else's equipment. So this comes back to electrical cutoff switches. Now I realize you can't use them on every piece of equipment. But when you look at your individual pieces of equipment, there's some that can be used. Now, some of the things that are out there now is, is the talk about using big circuit breakers on your, uh, on your battery cables, potentially, on your, on your high amperage lines. It, that's all a possibility. And I can't answer every individual question on what will work and what won't work, but what we're what we're trying to express upon everybody is we'll take shops that have electric cutoff switches and you go in there and they don't use them. This goes back to that culture thing that I talked about. Supervision has to set the culture and make this important. And things that are deemed important by supervision typically will be followed up on with the employees. It seems like a routine thing. It seems like yeah, it's never going to happen to me. Well, these fires don't happen once every few years. These fires happen several every year. So it does happen, and it happens when you least expect it. When you're doing that pre-trip, post-trip, or you're doing your maintenance, take a little peek at your, your electrical stuff and see if you notice a wire that's rubbing against the frame or little odd things like that, things that you might catch to save something short now, to save it having a problem. But that corrosion, goes back to that corrosion thing, is a big factor in that. Another picture or two here of the inside of that shop. The heat in those steel beams and whatnot, there's not an engineer out there that would, that would sign their name on the line and say that's a safe structure after the amount of heat that was in there. Okay, so keep that in mind. Try to set that culture of safety and preventive, preventive maintenance, I guess, preventive stuff to, to keep everybody and everything safe. Operator training. Like I said, I spent over 17 years in my career with the DOT working in this field in one form or another. So it's pretty near and dear to my heart. And I guess the biggest thing that, I, that I'll, I'll lay out there is when you hire somebody, they come in the door and I've seen this happen. I, I've seen them come in the door and you hand them a flag and you go, you're working with that guy and I don't wanna hear nothing from you. Well, an employee is a huge investment and we have to take the time to mold that employee to be the person that we want them to be, to be that employee. I realize everybody's a little different. However, people need to know what's expected of them. And if we're transparent in that fact, say, hey, this is what I want you to do. And here's how you go about it. That's really all we have to do. But how do you make a good operator? Well, you take that guy that brought the person in and they put him on that flag stick and, and sent him away, or you put them, geez, I got this new guy. I'm going to, I don't like this other guy. So if I put the two of them together and send them away, I killed two birds with one stone. 
When in reality, you just shot yourself right in the foot. You want to take that new person, you want to put them with your best person, maybe your best operator, your best employee, and mold them into that. If you take somebody, uh, a new person, and you put them with a slug, what are you going to have in the end? You're going to have two slugs. So you're not doing yourself or anybody else any favors. Need to mentor them. Put them with your best people. We just talked about that. Have a plan. Know what's expected. Take some homework on your part. When you hire somebody, what am I going to do with them? Who am I going to put them with? What do I expect out of them? Communicate, discuss ways of working safely. That's what we're doing today. We're just, this is a reminder session. We're just discussing different things that may be able to help your life. Here's one example. This is a whole room full of equipment operator instructors from the DOT. We're communicating. We're talking about our training programs and whatnot. You can do the same thing with your crew every day. If you're taking a handful of guys out and you're gonna go clean ditches, Grab those guys first thing in the morning, pull them around the truck, say, hey, here's where we're going to be working today. Here's who's doing what. Here's what to be looking for. It takes five minutes sometimes and can make a huge difference in the course of the day. You have to remember that training is an investment and it's a huge investment. It costs a ton of money, time and labor to get a person in the door. And let me tell you right now, there's help wanted ads for municipalities in places that I have never seen before. You know, in, in years past, these were dream jobs for to get in to work with a local municipality. And you couldn't get in the door unless you really knew somebody. And now they're they're hanging help wanted signs out on the street corner. But training, getting that person in, getting that right person and get them trained the way you want them is a huge investment takes time. It's not going to happen in a minute, not going to happen in a, in a week or a month. It takes time. You got to practice. So we're talking right now, we're talking about snow and ice operators. So you bring somebody in and you're going to run them as a snow and ice operator. Well, the best way in my estimation to do that is to put them with a seasoned vet and let them ride for a season or two seasons with them and maybe share the operating response the driving responsibilities back and forth. But in many cases now, that's not, it's not an option. You know, we need people in the driver's seat and we need them in there soon, but you can practice ahead of time. Get out in the yard, take that right today, take a guy out in that, on that sunny day in that yard and let them get familiar with that piece of equipment. When they're good in the yard, do a dry run. Go out and actually drive on the roads. There's nothing in the, in the world that says we can't get out with that plow truck when it's not snowing and go up and down the road. You can simulate what's going on, picking the plow up, setting it down, same with the wing, maneuvering around obstacles. And yes, Murphy's Law will prevail. I've hit really nice mailboxes in August and it really upsets people, but we fix it. We go back, take care of it. But you have to make that investment. And by the way, Murphy's Law says if there's a string of mailboxes and you're going to hit one, you will hit the nicest, most expensive one out of that string. That's just Murphy's Law. And then get people out under actual conditions, preferably with another person. And you, you got to spend some time there. Things are different when it's snowing and blowing and you can't see past the hood ornament. It's different. I rode with a guy in the city of Syracuse one day and we come down off one of the ramps off from 690 onto an interchange. And I said, where's the curbs down here? And he goes, well, I don't know. I've never done this when it wasn't, you know, when the curbs were covered and I couldn't see them. Well, that day you couldn't see anything and he didn't know where they were. You need to be out there under actual conditions and figure all that stuff out. And then get out and, and do it. Get out and spend that time. Hours behind the seat is the only way behind that wheel is the only way you're going to get that experience. Preseason scouting is another big thing, just like those curbs I just talked about. You go out and scout your roots ahead of time. 
and you got to you got to think about what you're looking at. But look at those curbs. Look at uh, sign placements, and and uh, you know maybe you got a manhole that's out of whack or whatever's out there. So do that root review. Look the root over. Make sure everything looks the way it ought to. See what's changed from last year. Identify the hazards. Has something changed or is this a new route to you or, or whatever, or you just need to refresh your mind. Curbs, we just talked about that. Figure out where they're at. Bridge joints, do you have a bad bridge joint someplace or something happened or they worked on joints since last year? Uneven pavement, maybe there was a paving project. Maybe somebody put a culvert in, um, who knows? Just something that can catch that plow. Where's your turnarounds? You know, sometimes businesses change, things change, but where am I going to turn around? Where where do you deem as supervision accept, acceptable for people to turn around? Is your buildings close to the road? Happens in a lot of rural communities or, or maybe even in a village setting where the storefronts are close and you got to slow right down. Gotta, you know, just it's just a reminder. It's a thing to get out and get your mind in gear. Delineation, do I need to add a delineator at my turnaround or someplace to, to help me know where things are when it's everything's covered in snow and you can't see anything? Bridge joints, we talked about that already. Manholes set high. I've seen that do a lot of damage on a plow. Um, you have a paving project come through and they set the holes a little high. It needs to be addressed in some form or another. New installation on curbing. Uh, I saw that where, and I don't know why our engineers do what they do sometimes with, with curbing installations, but uh, along in front of a shopping mall, basically, and where the entrances come and go, and you'd think all those curbs would be lined up. Yeah, no, not so much. So they, they jut in and out. Maybe that needs to have a little delineation on it. Here's an example of a bridge joint. Now, in this case, around the city of Syracuse, the guys will, and, and this happens everywhere. I shouldn't pick on the city of Syracuse. You got a bad bridge joint, so they put a red flag up here on the rail. So if an operator goes across that and they see the red flag, they go, huh, we need to pick up when they hit that, before we get to that joint. That's what that symbol is. It's a, it's a form of delineation. So we'll, we'll Flip over into some operating procedures. So plow trucks are hazardous vehicles according to VNT law, not emergency vehicles. What that really relates to is we need to follow the rules of the road to the very extent that we can. Yes, we have some protections out there under VNT law also, but it doesn't allow us to be bullies. So we have to go out, be respectful. Yes, we've got a job to do, but be respectful. Make sure we stop at stop signs. Make sure we um, do all of the courteous things that we need to do and still be able to get our job done. These guys are the real emergency vehicles. They got the red lights and the guns. Okay. So let's talk just a little bit about backing. What's your policy for backing? Do you have one? Do you use a spotter? I don't know the answers to these questions, but I do know that 99% of backing accidents are preventable. And think about it, minimize your backing and use spotters is the best thing I can tell you. Climbing under a wing. We know we talked about that cable deal. Well, let me tell you, I've seen a lot of cables break and wings come crashing to the ground like a big guillotine. When you see that fray in that cable, get the cable changed, but also don't climb under an unsupported wing. I don't know how many times throughout the winter I'll drive by a municipality's vehicle and they'll be parked someplace in the wing at half mast and they climbed out of the truck and they went under that wing so that they didn't have to get their crotch wet climbing over it. I get it. I'm short legged. I get it. But let me tell you, you never know when that wing's going to come crashing down and there's nobody on this webinar that's going to be able to hold one of them up. 
climbing on a hopper, that can be very dangerous. The ladders are slippery and and it's cumbersome. You're, you know, you got dressed in heavy clothes and whatnot. If we don't need to get up there, don't get up there. If you do need to get up there, there's a couple of things that we can do. And, and I got ahead of myself. If we do need to get up, there's a couple of things we can do. We can uh, do it in a well-lit place, like maybe at the shop. And believe it or not, if you pick your wing up and chain the wing up before you climb up that ladder, typically the ladders are right behind the wing on the passenger side of the vehicle. If you were to fall, you would tend to fall past that wing and not fall on it. Many, many years ago, there was a gentleman that fell off a hopper working for the DOT and landed on the wing. And the outcome was not good. It was a fatality. Would he have died if he'd landed on the ground? Maybe. But when he landed on the sharp end of that wing was really a bad, a bad deal. You, you have a better chance of, of surviving it falling on the flat ground. Obviously, the best thing is, is don't fall. And then the best way not to fall is don't get up there to begin with. So if you can minimize that and come up with another way, it's better. Plowing and spreading speeds. Tons of studies have been done. The best plowing and spreading speed is 28 to 32 miles an hour, um, not to exceed 32. Once you ex exceed 32, more than 50% of your material is lost through bounce and scatter. Your plows don't work as efficiently. Sometimes faster is not better. And uh, I could tell you some examples of that, but I won't bore you with it right now. But it's not a race. We're out there to do a good job. And, and that's what we need to do. Crossing the center line, I'm not gonna dwell on this either, but we have to share that road. And I know we gotta clean the center line, but you can't be a bully. And if in fact you're across the center line and you hit somebody, you're gonna be found at fault with that if they can prove you're across the center line. So share, read your traffic a little bit. You can figure out normally what you can get away with and what you can't, but don't be a bully out there. You are responsible and you can't get all of it all the time. We'll get the rest of it either on a return trip or the next time around. We'll get as much as we possibly can, but don't be a bully. Mirrors again, I just can't emphasize that enough. You need to know what's going on around you. Make sure they're adjusted well. We have a lot of obstacles in our mirrors to begin with. So take the time, get them adjusted and, and do the best you can. Here's an example of a post mirror that helps. Uh, like I say, all you can do is the best you can. Okay, this just talks about oncoming traffic. Here is climbing, like I talked about climbing up on the, on the hopper. Typically your accidents are gonna happen like the guy on the right, he's changing from the ladder position to the hopper, but you can see this wing is up and chained. Guy on the left, this wing is down. If he was to fall and come backwards, he could land out here on the end of that wing. Neither one of them are good scenarios. Once again, the best thing is to try to stay off there if you can. And typically with all salt programs now, we really don't need to be up on that, uh, on that hopper much, if at all. And then in your yards, a lot of yards have some sort of platform where you can reach across and, and uh, clean the top of your hopper off if you need to. Just a, an example of chain in the wing. Railroad crossings. Don't drag your iron across the railroad crossings. Pick up just slightly and then traffic and whatnot will, will do the rest. But you catch a plow or a wing down in that and uh, you're gonna go for a ride. You're gonna test that seat belt really good if you get caught in that. Shoulder plowing. Um, just, it's, it's really simple. Keep your truck in the road, keep your truck up on the pavement and on the, in the lane, the best you can. We don't need to run our trucks with the wheels right over on the edge of the shoulder and get four or six feet out past the shoulder out on that soft ground. Keep your plow and your wing on the good going. Now, 
I understand there's people on this webinar, I get that, that are in a municipality that's plowing a dirt road. You have my, my utmost respect, and that's a whole nother category that we're working in compared to the mass of the people that are on this program. Know where you are, figure out where you are in the road. You, you learn that after a while, you learn where, you're, where you are by the, the cues that are given around you. Keep your cables tight. Don't let that wing dig in. And use the wing not to plow on the shoulder. Over the years, we've had a lot of accidents where they pick the wing up, they slide over, put their wheels right out at the edge of the shoulder because they say the front plow throws the snow a lot better. Well, those shoulders are not designed for us to run those wheels of that heavy truck right out on the edge. And, and a lot of times they're next to a deep ditch or whatever. And the next thing you know, we're in the ditch or over an embankment. There's an example where, what are we doing? Why are we off there? The wheels of that truck had to be right out to the edge of the, the shoulder or off in the dirt. There's just no need for that. It's not like we had snow eight feet deep and we're trying to put a shelf in there. Boxing corners. A lot of things that go on with that, but you got to minimize your backing. So yeah, you may need to box the corner, but we all know also that the cars will sneak right up behind you. As soon as you turn that corner and you stop, next thing you know, there's a car so close behind you, you can't see them in the mirror. If you can minimize that when you're boxing your corners, maybe turn the corner, dump your snow off your, your plow and your wing and, and go to a gas station and turn around okay, I realize that's not going to work all the time, but look at your roots and see if, there, if you have some of those options instead of backing back into that intersection to continue on. Material usage, you know, thank God these days are gone. These old guys, they had their safety equipment though, by golly. They got their rail around their pipe rail around that box, feeding into that old whirly gig. Big thing with material, have a plan. What, what are you, what's your expectation? What do you got for materials, et cetera? Build a plan. Plan has to revolve around what's your goal. You know, are, you, are you just trying to have a little traction out there? Or are you trying to have bare road? What's, what's the goal? Spreader setup and material placement, it's huge. Remember, the material doesn't do you any good if you don't put it where it needs to be. So. Remember, speed has a, a factor in that. Remember, when we get over 32 miles an hour, 50% or more of our, our material doesn't go where we want it to go. Spend some time doing spreader setup. Spend some time following your trucks after they're set up, during actual conditions. And nowadays, cell phone video, GoPro cameras, things like that. Let the operator know. Give them, give them a little video and show them what's going on. And uh, trucks are different one to another. So spend a little time with that. Don't waste the material putting it where it doesn't need to be. That's simple. Don't waste our money. Remember, it's your money. It's my money. Know what you're putting down. The whole purpose to this is making good decisions. We know that, we know that you understand whether you're putting down salt, sand, cinders, whatever, but know how much you're putting down. Easy calibration is done with a bucket and a scale on most trucks. And that allows you to make informed decisions. You know, the, the old days of the old two knob spreader, we set them on two and two and we adjusted that gate until we had just a little bit left when we got back to the shop. You know, you always gotta have just a little bit left in case you stop at the diner. You know, when you get stuck in the diner, you gotta throw a little under the wheels to get out. I get that. But those days are pretty much gone now with using these, uh, computerized um, spreader applicators and, and running mostly salt. It's a little different program out there. But even if you're running an old two knob system, we can still calibrate it to the fact of knowing what you're putting down. Simple equipment, a hanging scale and a bucket, a shovel and a tarp maybe. Doesn't take a lot to calibrate a truck normally. What was our goal? You know, you look at this picture, some people say, wow, that's a, that's a terrible road. 
Well, maybe it is and maybe it isn't. You know, we got a little hard pack on there, but we don't know all of the information to make an informed decision by looking at this picture. I can tell the shadows are long. Does that mean it's morning or it's late in the day? What's the temperature out? What's the traffic volumes? We got to know more than what we can just assume from this picture. This one here is probably my, one of my bigger pet peeves is the change in conditions at a turnaround. Especially this one, it's on a hill and a curve. So you're coming off from a good road and imagine this, it's in, it, if this was at night, you come off a good road and then all the ones I'm into this hill and curve and I go on to a bad section of road. I'm not saying anybody did anything wrong. It could simply be timing. Maybe the other truck just is, is a little behind getting there. But quite often we find that we're on two different programs. And I don't know the answer to this, but these are situations. It's that change in condition of what the traveling public is expecting, that, that abrupt change that causes a lot of accidents. So think about that. Think about whether you talk to that other municipality and see what their program is. Maybe move this turnaround down the road so it's on a straightaway. Lots of options there, just things to think about. Another example, this one actually, you know, the material placement looks pretty good. We don't know what's going on with the weather, but the material seems to be at the center line and the left wheel track mainly, and it's gonna migrate out. Obviously it's a rural road, probably has low traffic volumes. There's a fair amount of snow there, you know. Just another example, maybe that's good for the conditions for that day. So avoiding disaster. We're at the tail end of the program here now. We're gonna just kind of wrap things up. Remember, don't take no unnecessary chances. We got a job to do, let's go out and do it. Let's do it safely. But we're not successful if we don't all go home at night. We're not successful if our equipment is broke down and in the shop. We need to take things in a systematic approach and be safe. Don't be a hero out there. Keep your cables tight. Stay away from the ditches. Pretty safe, pretty uh, simple stuff to, to think about. If you're putting in a shelf, maintain a good shelf life. Remember that frozen wing bank that you can ride that wing against is your feeler. It's like having a feeler out there when you can't see. So don't take that away by pushing your banks back too far. Maintain safe speeds. We talked about that time and again. And maintain your equipment. All simple things to help you avoid disaster. And with that, let's let her snow. You guys have a very safe season. And I really look forward to getting back to doing this in person with you. And I want to thank you all very much. Thank you so much, Bruce. It's a great presentation. Thank you for presenting Nimer Snow and Ice for 2000. Uh, folks, I'm just going to quickly share my screen, if I may, uh, so that I can uh, put up our, let's see. I wanna just put up a uh, email address that if you uh, want to, you can contact me. Okay. So just uh, email me at dbloodgood at rightinsurance.com. If you have any questions, if you want some materials sent to you like the fire prevention checklist and uh, a list of courses that you can access online Again, Bruce, thanks for presenting Nimer's Snow and Ice Safety. Everybody out there, thank you for attending and have a terrific day.